into um, you know, there's a body. I'm obviously a, a body or speaking through a body. Um, things like male, female, is the body male or female? Um, you know, on an educational background, um, social status, um, language, what language do I speak? Am I multilingual, bilingual? Um, just on and on and on and on. These are stacks and stacks and stacks of meanings that the particular thought forms have been constructed in a in a specific way that makes this small self unique and different from every other. Mm -hmm. It's a particular perceived. configuration that seems to to define myself as other than, different than, separate than the next self. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, there's where the conflict can arise. If, if, if I perceive myself as apart and different from yourself, then, and, and that myself is important, then in areas where our configurations and our constructs of the world and our self and reality are different from one another, then we have a difference of opinion. Then, we have set up a situation where there's a competition between us or something to fight about or something to um, to prove or to win or to be right about. And and that that intention or that that sense of connectedness, that sense of oneness has to go immediately when once that is accepted. So from this point of view, you can see how important it is to step back in the mind away from the constructs, to let go of those of the constructs. How, how would peace be possible if, if everyone has a different construct of themselves, a different concept, and that these concepts are not, um, that, that the differences are accentuated? that it's a sense of, of, if I give in to what you want, if I give in to the way you see it all the time, then there won't be any of me left, kind of, you know. The sense of compromise that enters into relationships, uh, you know, I'll give in this much, you give in this much, we'll try to find a, a middle ground. In, in a sense, from the from the self-concept or the construct point of view, it's a weakening of the self-concept of the construct because, you know, now it's something, a, something is given up. Something's given up mm -hmm. or something is eroded away. Um, and usually only given up because it's perceived that what can be gained is greater than, than what is given up. Mm -hmm. Yes. And it's a perceptual sense, too. I mean, in, in one sense, some could say a marriage or any kind of collaboration is a coming together and a pooling of, of material resources, of skills, of, of objects, so that you have more than you had before. But we're back to that idea of thought form associations, that, that um, all thought form associations are projections. And literally, the the mind is whole and complete um, in a state where it doesn't project, in a state where it just thinks only the thoughts that God created. It it has no thoughts apart mm -hmm. from God, which which is pure abstraction. There, God is not associating thought forms. So this really gets at uh, at the core of of any perceived problem in the world. If if I'm trying to attain something or achieve something in the world, if I that's where all my expectations would then arise from this this configuration, this construct of thought forms, and to start to see the futility of that 
to start to see that all that, all those associations are, are an attempt to maintain the subject-object split. That, that I am distinct and separate. That everything is an attempt to do that. Then once that can be seen and grasped, then then one would would start um, disidentifying oneself from those those thought forms and constructions. Then one could could start to let go of those things without um, feeling that all will be chaos mm -hmm. if I let go of that. Mm -hmm. Because in fact, all is peace when that subject-object split is let go of. I noticed that um, before when I was saying that it just seemed, you know, impossible to let go of all those thought form associations. It was also because I was thinking of it in terms of kind of all or nothing, mm -hmm. like, you know, just a total, a total wipeout. Mm -hmm. And it's never gonna, it's never going to come about in that way. It's always going to be what the mind can let go of at any given time. You know, it's like in a way, I don't have to, to fear that I have to, like, in a, in a moment, let go of every single association. I mean, ultimately, I guess I do, but, but my experience of it is that little by little, I'm able to let go. Well, the fear arises um, just from the intimations that, the intimation that in an instant it could be all let go of. I mean, there, when, when the mind becomes very attached to these thought form associations, to this personhood, <laughs> this important person that, that it calls me, then it does seem like this, like leap into the void. I mean, of like what what will happen, or who will I be, you know, if I'm not who I think I am, mm -hmm. and, and I'm not this person, and I'm not in this world, and so on and so forth. There's a fear that arises. And in a sense, the, that the idea that, well, you know, little by little I can do this piece by piece, and, and so forth, a little bit of the idea you're getting at is a, is a projection, too, of, of the mind because of the fear. So it's going to project this shift or this change to time. It's a gradual thing because that's gentler in my mind mm -hmm. than an abrupt, you know, total sweep of things. Yes. It's in, in a sense, then, it's a metaphor for the mind that I can, that I can watch my feelings and I can and gauge by my feelings when I start to be off-center or I start to feel uneasy or uncomfortable to start to, to use that as a point of a clue or to something to notice to bring it back to train my mind. All the while there is some awareness in the mind that of course that um, it, it's an instant that, that even the vague um, awareness that it it is all or nothing that it can be um, let go in in any instant. I mean, it's kind of like you can look at it from two perspectives. That can be to a mind that could be a fearful thing, or as the mind starts to really embrace that and start to see that idea as as a reality, then it's it's welcomed with joy. For one person, it can be, one mind can, can think, boy, I'm glad I've got some time to work this thing out, you know, in a gradual way, because it seems so enormous, and I'm going to have to just chip away bit by bit, piece by piece, 
from another perspective, you could look at it um, from the from the idea of what would this what would this say about God or the Holy Spirit that um, salvation if salvation was given and the answer was given immediately to the problem of separation um, then mm. the answer is available immediately and God Completely. yes God isn't um, giving this torture chamber of time that you know you, one has to go through to before you can finally accept that answer but the answer has been given. The idea that it can be gradual, again, is just another construct of the mind. Yes. It, which involves time, of course. Mm -hmm. Time involves intervals that, that in reality don't exist. And. Um, so is it a helpful construct of the mind? It, it's helpful depending on the use to which it's put. I mean, once again, we, we really have to get rid of that idea of purpose. Mm -hmm. That. Um, if time is given over to the Holy Spirit's purpose, um, it's helpful in that sense. It's not seen as a trap. It's not seen as something that has to be escaped from. It's not seen as i got to count the hours and the minutes and the seconds. Um, it's not seen as, oh, I can't wait to get this over with. I want to just, you know, get out of time and escape from it. It's, it's 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 used. Time has been given to God's teachers. It's in their hands. It, it can be used by their minds. And in a sense, you know, you get into the idea of trying to save time or collapse time. So in that sense, it's, it's given a, a connotation of being helpful. Now, also that brings it back to this. We, we keep talking about this instance. How do you feel right now? I mean, that, in that sense, time is helpful to keep focusing on how do I feel right now because that is the aspect of time that touches on eternity, the present. How it could be unhelpful or how it could be perceived as um, in a way that maintains the separation is the linear view of time where we get into the past, present, and future are seen to be continuous. And um, in that sense, the past and the future are given some sense of reality. That they, for instance, like they really, there's a belief that they really do have an existence. And and one always can can find reason to feel guilty if one looks at one's past. You know, something that that one is that one feels guilty about, something that another person didn't do or didn't follow through on, or so forth. And one can always find something to worry about when the future is believed in. Whether it's, um, you know, you know, how can I get another job, or will I find a relationship that can satisfy me, or more satisfying than the one I'm in, or um, will I find a career that will allow me to do what I really want to do, it's always a matter of looking for something that will have things be different than they are. Yes. And in a sense, the, the future, like the past, then is a defense against the holy instant. The holy instant being that, that all is perfect right now. There's such a sense of rest. There's such a sense of stillness in that idea. Contentment. It's an idea that if it's grasped by the mind, if it's if the mind focuses its attention on it, that all the striving and the pursuing and so forth and the thought form associations we've been talking about are always past thought form associations and they can be projected into a future, but in that sense the past and future are both part of those thought form associations. You need thought form associations, you need to have a self-concept or a construct before the past and future can have any meaning, because they are literally one and the same. So with the undoing of the self-concept, 
is also the undoing of that whole linear time concept.